الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام و سیدنا محمد و علی آلہ و صحب اجمعین و من استن بسنتی بحسان اللہ یوم الدین الحمد للہ الذی هدانا لہذا و مکننا لنہتدی لولا ان هدان اللہ السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ I would like to welcome you all to another session of commentary from the series on the 40 hadith of Imam Nawi rahimahullah and we are alhamdulillah with the fadl of Allah on the discussion on hadith number 8 and the title for this hadith is the concept of jihad and inshallah let us begin with the recital of the hadith An ibn Umar radi anhuma anna rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal umirtu an اقاتل ناس حتى يشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمدا رسول الله ويقيم الصلاة ويؤت الزكاة فإذا فعلوا ذلك عصموا مني دماءهم وأموالهم إلا بحق الإسلام وحسابهم على الله تعالى رواه البخاري ومسلم and the translation عبد الله بن عمر narrated the prophet the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I have been ordered to fight against the people until they testify that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah and until they perform their prayers and pay the zakah. And if they do so, they have gained, they will have gained protection from me for their lives and property unless they do acts that are punishable in accordance with Islam and their reckoning is with Allah, the Almighty. And this is narrated in the two most authentic books in Al-Bukhari and in Muslim. Well, this hadith is important for us to be aware of and understand properly because it is it can be rather controversial. I mean, many of the Islamophobes know this hadith as well. And it's important to have the proper perspective of this hadith in line with uh, the commentary for the scholars and also in relation and context with our situation as well at this time and state of the Ummah. And in terms of the first part of the hadith where the Prophet وسلم, said, Umirtu an uqatila nasa hatta yashadu Allah ilaha illallah. So the Prophet said, I have been commanded to fight the people. Uqatila is from qatala, which means to fight. It is derived from qatala, which means to kill, which of course is not this word, but this word is qatala, which means to fight. That's important to also make sure we make that distinction. Because some people, if they don't know the proper Arabic, they may confuse qatala with qatala, which is a big error. Anyway, the point of interest in this part of this hadith, and actually perhaps the most important word to sort of like focus in on, is the word anas. The Prophet says, I've been ordered to fight the people. So, what does anas mean? The majority of scholars say that anas, the people, refers to the Arab policy. Yes and Hijaz at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And the same interpretation can also be found in the Qur'an in Surah Nasr, where Allah says, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَاتِحِ وَرَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا Here in Surah Nasr, Allah says, And you will see the people entering into the religion of Allah in multitudes. Okay. And this is the predominant view regarding this hadith and is also the view which is shared by Imam At-Tabari who has the most lengthy and voluminous compilation of tafsir in the religion up to date. The second opinion is that the Prophet ﷺ was referring to all people excluding Ahlul Kitab or the people of the book. Proponents of this opinion hold that this hadith was abrogated by later rulings of jizya. And yet there's another opinion which interprets this hadith by saying that the people, including Ahlul Kitab, have to accept the domination or supremacy of Islamic laws. And this can be done through peace accords, paying the jizya, and also through fighting, as mentioned in this hadith. And in Surah Anfal, for example, Allah Azawajal says the following, وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةٌ وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ كُلُّهُ لِلَّهِ فَإِنْ انْتَهَوْا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ 
Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and fight them until there is no fitna and that the deen of Allah, the religion of Allah is totally for him. And this is in Surah Anfal. So another evidence to support this opinion is that Abu Bakr Adan fought those who refused to pay the zakah even though they did make the testimony of faith. This happened in the Rida Wars after the death of the Prophet Sosom where some of the tribes around Hijaz refused to pay the zakah. And Abu Bakr Radan fought those Muslims as the Khalifa who refused to pay the zakah because this was uh, part and parcel with the testimony of faith. And this opinion is also touted as the strongest opinion as per the commentary of Sheikh Zarabozo as well. So it's important to also be cognizant of this opinion, of this hadith. Continuing in the commentary of this hadith, it is very important that we know that there is no compulsion in the religion. That means the hadith cannot be forced upon someone. That no one can be forced to accept Islam. Because Allah Azawajal says in Surah Baqarah, He says, لا إكراها في الدين okay. There is absolutely no compulsion in religion. And this is a very strong negator. The la of categorical negation. This la. Like for example, لا إله إلا الله لا إكراها في الدين So basically the fact that there is a fatha, a single fatha on the word which follows the la is a sign of the la of categorical negation. Also another incident from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where, which is narrated by Usama bin Zayd that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ sent us in a raiding party. We raided Huraqat of Juhayna in the morning and I caught hold of a man and he said, La ilaha illallah. I attacked him with a spear. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ said, Did he profess that there is no God but Allah and even then you killed him? I said, Messenger of Allah, he made a profession out of fear of the weapon. He وسلم, observed, did you tear his heart in order to find out whether it had professed or not? And he went on repeating it until I wished I had embraced Islam that day. And this is narrated in Al-Bukhari. So lessons, additional lessons from this hadith. So well, this topic, this topic of jihad, is a controversial topic. So this topic, as I mentioned before, should be studied well and with care. At the same time, this is an essential aspect of Islam, which needs to be understood properly and not out of context. We have to understand that Islam is the one and only true religion, of course, being adherence to it and submitting to La ilaha illallah. And one of the divine laws, since Allah created the heavens and the earth, is that evil is always fighting and opposing the truth. Like for example, we know the swearing of shaitan, that he swore to misguide us until the end of time. Okay, So this is synonymous with the evil which is always fighting and opposing the truth. So therefore, the truth has to be protected and it needs power for its protection. The main philosophy of jihad is meant to establish and maintain justice and truth. And that's very important. Its purpose is not to promote terrorism or bloodshed or the shedding of innocent lives. No, the whole point of jihad in Islam and its various means and methodologies is to establish and maintain the justice and the truth. And jihad is also something which is legislated by an Islamic state under one khalifa. The Uthmani Khilafa collapsed in 1924. And since then, we do not or have not had a true Islamic state. Well, that's very important to realize that you know, collective jihad in terms of fighting, that's legislated by an Islamic state which we don't have. So it's not applicable in that sense. So it's important from this also to realize that no individual group can take this into their own hands and claim jihad as we see extremists doing. Murder in the name of Islam has ruined its image and continues to happen. Randomly killing civilians, non-Muslims, through terrorist actions are major sins that are not accepted by Islam. And it's also important to note that the West, on the other hand, follows a double standard on this topic of fighting. They say it's barbaric to fight in the name of religion, yet they fight all over the globe to preserve their values militarily, placing economic sanctions, etc. One example of this we cannot forget is from the embargo, the 
economic embargo on Iraq many years back when Saddam Hussein, the brutal dictator, was ruling. Madeleine Albright, when she was asked whether the lives of 500,000 Iraqi children, half a million children, due to the economic sanctions was worth the price, and she said yes. This is decades before the 9-11 tragedy. So, if we have these type of people who are literally, I mean, where hundreds of thousands of lives are being lost just from economic sanctions, I mean, isn't this a double standard? How barbaric can you be? Even the shedding of one life is sacred in Islam from the Qur'an. If you shed the life of one innocent person, it is as if you shed or killed the entire community. Please note that the Arabic term defines jihad as struggle. There are other forms of jihad which are less commonly perceived. These include the following. Number one, da'wah. Dissemination of knowledge and the education regarding Islam. Removing and minimizing evil and maximizing good. Reconciling clashes and conflicts between Muslims and the Muslim communities. And also striving for the betterment of the community. So these are all aspects of jihad as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be a something which involves fighting. So how do we deal with the concept of jihad in our contemporary life? There exist oppressed Muslim communities where fighting may be the choice. This is especially the case for Muslims whose lands have been invaded or occupied. It is their right to defend their land and home. And no one can you know, refute that, that right. Okay. Even if they be Muslim or not Muslim. Unfortunately, Muslims who confine jihad to fighting are destroying the image of Islam. And as we mentioned before, jihad has been a part of Islamic history since the time of the Prophet ﷺ. But also you have to remember that it was not the first injunction laid out on this ummah, but it was also part of the history of Banu Israel, the children of Israel as well. So it is important to know that it has an important role in establishing justice and law throughout the globe from even before the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So focusing on the internal challenges which face the ummah, unfortunately, today the Muslim ummah is not united. It is divided and split into so many different groups and sects, whether it's ethnic, whether it's political, religious, based on different economic class. Conflicts seem to exist everywhere between Muslims, unfortunately. It is also mentioned in the Qur'an that the shaitan creates conflicts and disputes between Muslims. Allah Azawajal says in Surah Baqarah, فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِّينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ he says in Surah Baqarah, And yet they learn from them that by which they cause separation between man and his wife. But they will not harm anyone through, through it except by permission of Allah. So even at the microscopic level, in terms of families, shaitan is there to cause division. And even to the point of causing division between the man and his wife. And this is one of the common plots of shaitan. Divide and conquer. Okay, In this current situation, so jihad needs to be exercised to reestablish the unity of the Muslim communities and that of the ummah. And it also means to remove and minimize clashes and disputes and establish peace. Another struggle or jihad is the education of the Muslim ummah. Unfortunately, there is a great lack of understanding of Islam by Muslims themselves. The majority of Muslims today do not understand the true meaning of Islam, even the basic concepts. So here jihad comes in the form of disseminating the true message of Islam to the Muslims and educating them so that they can fully understand their deen. Alongside with the internal challenges of the ummah, there are also many external challenges that we need to be conscious of. Okay. And these are problems that are being imposed upon us by the opponents of Islam. They're continually developing different ways of finding the Muslims and trying to rule the Muslim world. And these external challenges include things such as globalization, modernism, shamelessness, fahisha, 
misuse of technology to corrupt the minds and also corrupting the pure original Muslim values which have been there since the time of the Prophet ﷺ in our communities. So what we need to do is we need to be assertive along with having and adjusting ourselves socially and psychologically in these changing times in globalization when you have modern technology such as the iPhone which has many different aspects and things related to the internet such as whether it's Facebook or YouTube we need to have the proper Islamic adjustment so that we can maintain our identity we can maintain our values that we are not corrupted and so these are great challenges that we face today and we have to be practical also in dealing with these challenges for example when we talk about Islam we usually talk about it in the theoretical sense you know what is taqwa, what is ikhlas but we need to implement these Islamic concepts into our everyday lives in the 20th century and in our society which has changed dramatically from 1400 years ago but still the same basic problems and issues are there but they're just in a different way in this modern society so as we face all these different challenges and dilemmas we have to infuse these Islamic concepts and preserve our identity, preserve our values and the deen as well now Muslims as role models Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا He says, and thus we have made you a just community أُمَّةً وَسَطًا that you will be witnesses over the people شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ and the messenger will also be a witness over you. Ayah 143. And then Allah also says in Surah Ali Imran, He says, You are the best nation. كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ The best nation produced for mankind, you enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. Okay. And this is Surah Al Imran, Ayah 110. So we need to establish ourselves as role models for other nations, but we are unfortunately not doing so. Since the majority of Muslims do not truly understand Islam, nor do they practice it. They're hypocritical, they're not true and sincere to their faith. And unfortunately, because of this, the shahada of the Muslim Ummah is not convincing to others and is faulty. Elevation of the Ummah. Okay. The elevation of the Ummah as the role model is a great jihad and struggle that we should undertake. However, this is a long-term effort and may take a very long time, perhaps even decades to establish. Nonetheless, we need to embark on this step, step by step, properly and with proper calculation. So, for example, the effort to educate Muslims about their religion needs to be taken because of the great ignorance out there about Islam in, among the Muslim community and the masses. Likewise, the effort to make them practice and elevate their Islamic morals, character and adha, which are deteriorating as we go on in the 20th century. And related also to this great cause as we discussed is the need to unite the Ummah which is disunited. Looking at the Muslim Ummah today, one important concept which is missing as we discussed in the prior hadith is Al-Wala. Al-Wala contains four elements which are love, care, help and protection for each other. Okay. All these basic elements are missing unfortunately from the Ummah today and they need to be revived in order to achieve unity. Okay. So with the basic lack of Islamic knowledge and this disunity which exists, the situation of the Muslims today appears bleak. How can we talk about the supremacy and the dominance of Islam if the Muslims today are in such a weak state? It's basically wishful thinking and not having the proper scope and understanding of the situation at large. There's so many discrepancies, contradictions, obstacles and shortcomings. 
the ummah has macroscopic problems and also microscopic problems. Okay. So in order to make the shahada convincing, we need to practice its great values, concepts, and principles and follow the rulings and guidelines of Islam. And by doing so, we will portray the true image of Islam, which is the perfect model for other societies, communities, and nations. Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat li nas. Very important ayah. We cannot forget this ayah. We are the model, no one else. So inherently, the dominance of Islam means justice, good values, and the well-being for humankind. Again, kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat li nas for the people. It's not for us. We are. We want to spread Islam not for global domination, not for wealth, not for power, but as Allah says in Surah Muddathir, where He commanded the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya ayyuhal muddathir kun fa'andir wa rabbaka fa'kabbir And your Lord, magnify. And this is basically what we do in terms of spreading Islam to others. People realize the true greatness of the most great, which is Allah Azawajal. Going forward, coloring the Muslim identity. One method of shaitan is to alter and change the appearance of our perception. Okay. And this is also being done by different means such as mass media, internet and technology today. Whether it's through pictures, spoken or written words, images, these methods are used to change and alter our perception as subtle as they may be. They're used to influence our attitudes and values and the way we view the world. Allah Azawajal says, and quoting the statement of Iblis, Ar-Rajim, Allah Azawajal says, he quotes Shaitan, he, Shaitan says, my Lord, because you have put me in error, I will surely make disobedience attractive to them on the earth, and I will mislead them all, except among them your chosen servants. إِلَّا عِبَادِكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ Accept those, those servants of yours who are sincere. Okay, that's why sincerity is so important. It will protect us from being attacked by shaitan. Because when we're insincere, then he'll basically jump on us and cause us to swerve. Okay, so we need to be aware of the situation around us and be cognizant about what is being designed to influence us. All this technology, this modernism, isn't for our well-being necessarily. It is tailored to try to change your perception of things, to change your thinking, your attitude, away from the, the fitrah, which Islam has, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has infused you with from beginning since your birth. Okay. The opponents of Islam are using many diverse means to threaten our values, beliefs, and identities as Muslims. We are often, unfortunately, not aware that we are subjects of schemes of others and that Muslim minds are being manipulated and brainwashed. Today, the future of the Muslim masses is being planned and designed. Yet, the vast majority of Muslims, unfortunately, are not aware of these efforts. This includes planning into the distant future, whether it be think tanks, institutions, or various governments. Okay. So, it is therefore essential that we counter these external challenges and evils. These negative influences and value systems are countered by using the same tools, but infusing them with values, uprightness, and knowledge of the truth or haq of Islam. So technology can be used for both negative and positive means. We must master technology in this modern society and age of globalism and be in control of it. We can use it for our benefit. We cannot just be passive users. Okay. So when we use a technology, such as the internet and the media, we must use it in a way that we are in control of it. For example, we must replace music with the Qur'an, with tafsir, Islamic audio and ilm. If we need to or have a strong desire to listen to music, let's replace it with nasheed, which are halal, according to Islamic guidelines. We have to protect our children from the internet, from smartphones, and their many evils, and shameless media as well, and give them the halal options out there. 
You also have to be very careful with the vulgar apps, video games, and movies, just like how we protect them from bad company. We cannot also ourselves waste our time on things like Facebook, YouTube, Internet. We have to prime ourselves with beneficial things. So we have to utilize all the technology and things around us for good and not bad. Okay. Also, we cannot let technology be used to spread false things about the religion in Islam as it is being happening everywhere, by every means, by those who are against us. This is so that we can go back to the original pure form of Islam in terms of values, beliefs, and attitudes. This is one important arena for our Muslim educators and intellectuals to focus on, to work on, and to warn others about as well. The how to deal with new technology, the proper way of using the internet, the proper way of using smartphones. This is very important for us, the scholars and the ulama, to guide the Muslim masses about. Next, the last part of this hadith, which is very important, I think, for all of us to understand, and also goes back to hadith number one, the hadith on intentions. And Rasul Sussam ends this hadith with, وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى And their reckoning will be with Allah the Exalted. Okay. But the Prophet Sussam says that, I have been ordered to fight people until they believe in the shahada. And basically, he says at the end, that their hisab is with Allah. He still doesn't know what is in the people's hearts. Their hisab will be with Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will know what is in their hearts. Okay. But this is in conformity to accepting their testimonies of faith openly. Okay. But we leave their internal beliefs and realities to Allah. So this is, for example, like the hypocrites. Even though we know that hypocrites are not Muslims, we have to accept the testimonies of everyone openly in general, and leave their internal realities to Allah to judge. So if a person becomes Muslim openly, just to save his life or for some other worldly purpose, but makes this in no way apparent, then the Muslims must accept, we must accept this from him and leave the reality of that to Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said to Khalid bin Walid and Narid bin Abu Sa'id al-Khudri in both Bukhari and Muslim, Prophet said, I have not been ordered to investigate the hearts of the people nor to rip open their bellies. But well, this is also an important statement, this last statement of this hadith, to all Muslims that the apparent might not equal the internal. Thus someone may do a seemingly good action outwardly, such as hijrah for example, but their niyah is not for Allah but for a worldly thing. And that is also why we should not justify a sin because of compelling circumstances or using a legal judgment or a fatwa that just to justify the action that normally would not be used. Okay, like a variant opinion, for example, where normally a variant opinion would not be used to justify something. Because internally, you know it's wrong. You know it's wrong, but you're using something to sort of justify that action. So what do we mean? There's a few examples we can use in this respect. Let's say you live in a predominantly Christian country. And you're going to a Chinese restaurant. In general, the religion for Chinese people or Chinese is Buddhism. Okay. I mean, they may be Christian, but in general, that's the main religion of Chinese. And you're saying basically that it's okay to eat in that restaurant because the meat is, quote unquote, we live in a Christian country. So it's okay. It's not okay because we're only sanctioned to eat the meat of the Jews and Christians. And again, there's deference on that aspect even if you use that very opinion to say that because there's no way you can defend yourself from the Quran and Sunnah from that. Or for example, uh, doing a secret marriage, seeing that it's okay if you have a couple of witnesses. Okay. And no one knows about this marriage, not your family, not the community. And this is not in the Sunnah way of marriage. Marriage is supposed to be open for the community to know who is husband and wife. Okay, These are basically just ways of doing something which is perhaps Muharram. Or for example, killing a person, saying that he is part of a sect outside Islam. And this unfortunately is happening in Muslim countries. People are being labeled as terrorists and being thrown into jail. They're being labeled as someone who is creating difficulty or creating fitna for the society. Just because the government doesn't agree with their opinions or some of their beliefs or their thinking. I mean, by doing this, by imprisoning people, killing people, 
based on these allegations that they're not Muslim or they're creating fitna or they're a terrorist while there's no evidence that they did that. This is what's happening, unfortunately, in our Muslim lands. And it has to stop. It has to stop. And many times, who are uh, there to give that judgment is a quote-unquote scholar or a judge or a qadi. Ma'adullah. So we have to take a stand against injustice. And this is ways in which our religion is being denigrated and corrupted. Another thing which I've heard is, for example, pornography is okay because, quote-unquote, it's just an image. Ma'adullah. Kalla. It's haram. It's nothing but fahisha. Anytime we have anything similar to pornography, we should literally just cover our eyes. You know, just cover our eyes. If you see a bad action, make sure children are not watching it. Turn it off. And you you yourself, you should just cover your eyes because you may not be able to keep in control of that, just in case. Just be very frank about that. There's nothing you need to be apologetic about. You see something horrible, disgusting, tasteless, you back off, you look away from it. Okay. And this is, this is to protect our Haya, this is to protect Islam, this is to protect our character. If we become corrupted, forget it, we've lost everything. Because now we don't have any guidelines. And this is unfortunately what these Muslims do to cover their actions because they're just involved in sin ma'adullah. Another funny thing, just uh, outrageous, is when Muslims out there who are healthy, who are strong, claim that they can't fast in Ramadan because, quote-unquote, uh, fasting causes me digestive problems or stomach pain. What these people are experiencing is hunger. This is, these are hunger pains. Face it. This is fasting. This is what fasting does. It makes you realize also how people, so many millions of people feel on a daily basis when they don't have food. It's called hunger pains. Okay? You fast because you have to. It's commanded to by Allah Azawajal. Not making these stupid petty excuses. We're very good. The Ummah is very good at making excuses. Whether it's to pray, or it's too difficult, or I can't do it, or uh, I'm not clean enough. I mean, you hear all these different excuses. Give a black eye to all your excuses. Anytime when a sin is being committed. If you do a sin, just do tawbah. And that is the way of the Muslim. None of us are perfect. But do not make excuse for a sin because this is exactly what shaitan did. So here, sharia is used to justify an act which is internally really haram. And outside, they may even have a fatwa. They may have very Islamic opinion to justify it. right? But internally, really, if you look at it, and if Allah knows it, and Allah alam, Allah knows best, that really is done for just pleasing their own desires and doing something which they know internally is haram. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you're doing and why you're doing something. So to justify an evil action based on a religious grounds and to pick a very Islamic ruling or opinion just to justify its inception. This is deception. This is khayana. And this goes back to hadith number six. Okay, on doubtful matters. If you are doing something on a doubtful matter, then stay away from it. And that's the advice and the commandment of the Prophet Wasallam. So we all sin, but we need to do istighfar and tawbah frequently and not make excuses since this will lead the person to become a sinner and to become corrupted. And unfortunately, we are seeing this very commonplace in many different levels in the Muslim Ummah all over, big people and small people, scholars as well, versus the regular Muhammad and Fatima. Okay. So in conclusion, it is important to have a proper understanding of this hadith with respect to the concept of jihad. Here it is important to note that the term anas in this hadith the people who the Prophet was commanded to fight against it refers to the Arab polytheists by the majority of scholars. We have also seen that the concept of jihad encompasses many different forms to propagate the true message of Islam to others. It can also encompass education, da'wah, and establishing the peace in the ummah. And it can also encompass the meaning of fighting when Muslim lands are threatened, occupied, or invaded. The shahada and other pillars of Islam are the foundation for this ummah. This is ideally the role model for other nations, the yani, the ummah, which upholds the most exemplary justice, morals, and values for humanity. Unfortunately, Muslims in today's world are facing many dilemmas in upholding the ummah to its responsibility as the just and righteous nation. There's so many internal divisions from within, alongside with lack of knowledge and understanding. 
regarding the true essence of Islam. At the same time, there are also external challenges where Islam is being incorrectly portrayed by, for example, the Islamophobes or our opponents, and where Muslim identities and moral values are being challenged. So what we need is assertiveness along with a social and psychological adjustment to the 20th century. We need to determine how we can live in this modern world as a good Muslim while maintaining our identity and moral values. These are the great challenges that we face today. We have to be practical in dealing with these challenges. We have to talk about Islam, not just in the theoretical sense, but we need to implement these concepts into our everyday lives and society, especially as we face all these different challenges and dilemmas. So with this, inshallah, you should be able to answer these following questions regarding this hadith. And Jazakallah khairan for your attendance. Subhanaka lahu hamdik wa nashhadu wa la ilaha illa ant wa sakfaq wa tubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.